welcome to another edition of the other perspective which takes place every wednesday from 11 a.m to 11 to, to 12 a.m east african time the other perspective is brought to you by ACFIM, a pan-african political finance watchdog my name is abel eseru and i will be the show's host today before we proceed we want to join the rest of ugandans in paying our last respect to the country's departed speaker of the 11th parliament right honorable jacob olanya who departed us on sunday when god called him to join our fellows who have all left us let's observe some few seconds of silence as we pay our last respect to the departed speaker May his soul rest in eternal peace. So before we proceed, uh, kindly all our viewers outside there who are listening on, following us, uh, kindly subscribe to all our social media platforms. On Facebook, we are ACFIM. On Twitter, we are ACFIM UG. On YouTube channel, we are ACFIM Uganda. Today, we are going to be discussing about the newly created cities at Crossroad in Uganda. You know that Uganda is still stuck with the newly created cities that have failed to become functional. The Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development has failed to find resources to finance the cities. And therefore, they continue to operate on the budget of municipalities. The relationship between cities and their mother districts remain nebulous. According to the laws of Uganda, a city is an equivalent of a district. In this case, it's unclear whether the cities is in the district or vice versa. There is also infighting between the ministries on where the cities belong. On one hand, the Ministry of Local Government claims the cities belong to them because they created them. On the other hand, the Ministry of Land, Housing and Urban Development also claims that the cities belong to them because they are urban. But also there is also a question of the people who live in these cities. They thought that when these cities would come, they would change their lives. But there seems no change. They are not feeling any change in their lives in terms of uh, monetary income, where they, they, they thought that the cities would come booming with very many things, opportunities so that they would be able to make some good money. So today, in this discussion, I will be joined by three guests, starting with Mr. Henry Muguzi, who is an, an electoral democracy expert but also a passionate Ugandan who wants to see that development of, in the country is progressive and shall also be joined by an economist who will give us his economic perspective, Mr. Eddie Kainda, whether the creation of the cities were really intended to benefit Ugandans and also drive us economically, or they were just uh, politically created. And lastly, we shall have a youthful and an activist, Gerald Coraneza, who will bring his political science angle and try to share whether the cities really benefited the youth because Uganda is a, a country which is dominated by the young people. We shall see because most of the urban areas in these countries, in Uganda especially, are dominated by the young people. We want to see whether their lives really change with the coming of these cities. So I will start with Henry. What did we get wrong? Why are these cities not operational till today? Thank you, Abel. And uh, of course, let me also add my voice to the many that have uh, expressed their deepest condolences for the departure of one of the gallant sons of the soil, a political activist, but also a, gallant, uh, a passionate uh, nationalist who, who has left us and joined the long list of those who are departed. May he so rest in peace. Uh, thank you, Abel. I think it's important to start by tracing the genealogy, or if you like, the source and origin of these cities. We know, this is what we know, that in, uh, in, uh, before these cities were created, the matter was uh, brought for discussion and approval to the cabinet meeting. That meeting was chaired by His Excellency, General Yoweri Museveni. 
And when the issue of cities came up, uh, originally uh, the technocrats had wanted to grant status only three cities. The first one was Jinja, because the plan was to, you know, um, profile Jinja as a, an industrial city. So um, that is justifiable. Then the second one was Fort Porto, because the idea was to profile Fort Porto as a tourism city. And then the third proposal was in Barara. And uh, I think that was for reasons best known to themselves. Now, but as the discussion went on, some politicians started smelling the coffee. And that coffee was political mileage. They said, wait a moment, there is political mileage here. We are heading in, headed to the 2021 general election. There is a political mileage here. We are told by those that participated in that meeting that at that level, when the debate became heated, John M. Seven excused himself and left the matter to Ndugu, Dr. Rohakana Rugunda, to chair. And as you know, Ndugu is Ndugu. So Ndugu joined the bandwagon and it was agreed that there is political mileage here to gain. And therefore that list was grown to what we now come to see as 10 new cities that were created. The question you are making, you are asking, you are posing is, uh, and, the, and, and these were uh, Jinjam, Mbarara, Fort Porto, Masaka, Mbari, Arua, Guru, Koima, Lila. So that all of these have been signposted in the, in the books as uh, cities. And when you go to these cities, you find that the, 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 there are, the, the, all of these are anything but cities. But what went wrong? Uh, I've been trying to understand and make research about cases or, or examples of cities in the world that have ever emerged uh, as a, a result of political pronouncement. Until now, when I've been researching for two days, I have not found any. The only one I have found is called Badolite. Badolite was the hometown of Ndugu, uh, Pierre, uh, Joseph Desiri Mobutu, the man who came to be known as Mobutu Seseko. He decided to invest all the money into Badolite, transform it into, from a village to a city, put up skyscrapers up to today, the skyscraper is not withstanding, but the little is a village. So cities are not just created. Cities then it tells you something. What makes a city? There is an evolution that must uh, uh, that must uh, must happen. So what went wrong? Politics captured the process, and we have understood for the longest time that whereas politics. In all instances, when politics meets economics, politics captures economics. Politics does not only capture economics, it captures everything, including development, including uh, plans to develop cities or transform urban centers into cities. And therefore, politics captured the good plans of technocrats. And at that moment, the process was captured and taken over by, 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 by politicians. You will recall that in the original list of districts, my own massacre was not involved, was not, one, was not on the list. And so, as you recall, the Kabaka had to go and pitch camp, hold a press conference in the massacre and make strong statements that the rest of Uganda is getting district status but his own massacre cannot merit it. The following day, as you will recall, the minister of local government had to rush to massacre and declare massacre a city. What a massacre? Little massacre. My, my, my mother uh, goes often to a, a place called Kawonera, and I have uh, 
relatives there. So Kabonera is a division in Masaka City. And so it is called Kimanya Kabonera. But I interact with my colleagues there, my brothers, every time I go, I have never succeeded in convincing them that they are part of the city. So which city? So when politics captured these things, you would discover that as night follows day, everything now had to uh, uh, to, to, to be re-engineered to satiate the interests of politics. And so that went wrong. Secondly, there was no analysis taken on whether the resources available in the national budget can support a city. I think the men and women who sat in that cabinet meeting that was chaired by Nduguru Gunda forgot the economics or forgot that there is also something called the national economic implications. And therefore, until now, we cannot find the fund money to finance these, uh, these cities. And they, became, they, 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 they have almost become of no inconsequential. I remember my colleague uh, Benson was telling me that his own solid city there's been a, 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 a drive lately where people are requesting that if it were possible, they should revert back to their municipality status because this is not what they actually wanted. So it all went wrong when politics captured and then, uh, the, then the, the, the rest is history. I submit. Thank you, Henry. Edit, now I want to bring you Various scholars who have done something around urbanization do think that an unplanned drive for urbanization can affect development when the necessary infrastructure is not developed and when policies are not properly implemented. You have just heard Henry talk about how politics captured, politicians mm -hmm. captured the pressure of the cities. In your own view, do you think we just took up something we were not prepared for in terms of creating these cities? Uh, thank you, Abel, for inviting me to this conversation, and uh, I'll try to give my own opinion about uh, this topic. But um, uh, politics aside, uh, urbanization is a global trend, and uh, over the years, not only in Uganda alone, we have seen many persons or many people uh, driving from villages to urban centers either for jobs or for better living but i want what i want to uh to mention is that there's a growing trend of urbanization uh world over and uh, we have seen that uh, in uganda the urban trends have been uh, increasing for example in, in 1991 we had about uh, 1.7 uh, million Ugandans in urban centers, but uh, by 2016, we had about 7.4 million Ugandans in urban centers. That uh, that's about 20% uh, of the population. And uh, in 2050, in 2040, we expect to have about um, uh, 21 million Ugandans in urban centers. That is one. But two, uh, urban centers are centers that are purposely created for. Uh, Economic growth. You shall recall that 70% uh, of non agricultural trade, but also 70% uh, of non agricultural services, are found in urban centers. And uh, generally, countries or an economy can really grow if we do not have a deliberate effort to establish urban centers. Urban centers are centers of entrepreneurship, they are centers of um, uh, technological innovation, but also the centers of economic activity. Whereas, for example, would you go to an urban, an rural area and you find a person tuning in to a show like this, if it were not in urban, urban centers, look at the technology, technological developments that we do have countrywide. You won't find out that most of the services are centered within urban centers. But number three, Uganda had, has not only a legal but a constitutional role to ensure that uh, they purpose, we purposely establish urban centers. You shall notice that our constitution, I think it's Article 179, uh, uh, that establishes that parliament has uh, 
a mandate to establish urban centers, but also in the Local Government Act of 1997, I think it's a it's section uh, 7.2a, we, we need to create uh, centers of growth within a uh, Within, a, within, within, the, within the community so that we can always bring services nearer to the people. And uh, for me, that creates a genealogy, just like Muguzi mentioned it, the, of why we should establish uh, urban centers. And these urban centers, Muguzi uh, uh, has mentioned, they have been phased. For example, he mentioned uh, centers that were phased for phase one and phase two. But in phase three, around 20, July this year, 2022, we are going to have Entebbe as an urban center. But also in July 2023, we shall be having uh, Nakasongola, we shall be having Moroto, but also Wakiso gazetted as urban centers. And, and, and for me, uh, from the economic perspective, I really do not see a re reasons as to why other factors being constant, why should not establish urban centers, given the advantages I've mentioned. But also the, the challenge is that uh, when it comes to policy and criteria of establishing these urban centers, we tend to forego uh, certain specifics. For example, uh, the urban development policy uh, it states that for an urban center to be established, you need a population of about 300,000 uh, 300, uh, persons that are living within that area. And of course, most of Ugandan urban centers, oh, cities, I should say, in this case, uh, 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 fulfill that criteria, but also a uh, population density of about 20,000 persons per square kilometer within that area, but with an integrated urban management plan for the city. Now, the challenge we have is that uh, whereas we qualify in terms of population, in terms of uh, uh, coverage, we still have challenges with urban infrastructure. When we talk of urban infrastructure, most of the cities we do have fall short of that. You have seen the, the kind of urban noise that we do have in the cities. We have seen the kind of public transport facilities we have in the cities. You've seen the type of informal settlements that we do have and slums. We have, we have the, the challenge of solid and liquid waste management problem that we do have. We've seen that type of traffic congestion that we do have, I would not have a problem of to establish the cities the way they have established, but the challenge I have with management of the cities that we do have. But most importantly for me, when we are creating cities, we need Uganda looks at the long term, that world over, cities do not just emerge cities develop and there must be a deliberate attempt to ensure that a city is established. For example, a city that we think will have to grow and sustain itself in the next 50 years, the journey must be started today. Even uh, cities that we cherish in the world over, Johannesburg, London, uh, New York, among others, they just did not, did not emerge over time or established because they had these facilities, they had to grow. So for me, from the urban development perspective, I believe in naturalization, establishment, putting up the basic infrastructure, putting up the best legal system and management, governance and management, ensure that these cities can get to where they are. And of course, uh, with the growing trends in urban, uh, uh, rural, urban migration, we think that creation of more urban centers is the way to grow for economic growth, but also for engagement and establishment of services that people need. Talk to you, Abel. Abel, if I can add something on what Eddie has just uh, submitted. Uh, when you look around, and he has, as right, he rightly put it, mm. it is, should be centers for economic activity. Mm. They should also be centers for innovation, so people come to these centers, the cities, to look for economic activity. If you look around cities like Johannesburg, it developed because of gold that was being mined there. So many people had gathered for employment. If you look at other cities, whether it were Tokyo, whether it is Singapore, whether it was it is uh, London, these cities developed because people came for jobs. 
So if we wanted to grow cities and, and set up a trajectory of developing, evolving them, then we should have encouraged as a matter of policy, uh, the, 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 small, the, 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 the establishment of smaller factories, okay? Factories that employ between eight and 15 people, but many of them, which would be based on the uh, major agricultural produce of the area. Okay, uh, but in a situation where we don't have these, a situation where government has favored the large scale, the larger than life investors who are, have good work for the largest, for the, for, for the biggest part. A situation where the country, the, the government has decided to ad adopt a policy I call Chinaization, because everything has been given to China, because they think these are the big investors. And some of these Chinese who come, are actually faces are actually faces of of mafias from government itself they come hiding behind the faces of chinese to get land and grab land so because government has paid less attention to local artisans investment in in local factories the people don't have anything to do so today we have cities that are fed uh, that are who, whose residents are, are thriving on border borders you see, you cannot have the border border economy cannot grow a city. And therefore, by virtue of the fact that you, you have pronounced it and let it to flow, it cannot come from heaven. So we need to have deliberate government interventions that will make sure that when people come to the city, they are able uh, to, to find employment, especially in factories now, which is why. Because it is in the cities where you will find the malls, supermarkets, uh, cinemas, cinema halls, all of these kinds of things, all these amenities. But if you are you are a border border rider, where are you going to get the money? So government has to deliberately invest in encouraging local uh, investors, smaller ones, to invest and employ eight people, five people, but many of them, because this is what we've seen in other cities, whether it is London, whether it is Georgia and so on, but also there should be affordable housing, because a situation where you find you, you, my majority of the people live outside come outside the city, like we see in Kampala. In the evening, everybody has driven out of the of the city. Then what is the purpose? A city, worth the name, must have residents within the city that stay within the city. Not this one who like me and Mr. Kain and others who drive out and come in, and we 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 we, 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 guy, we, we deceive ourselves that we are in Kampala city. So I think these are, have, these are things that the, the, uh, the government has to be deliberate upon. If you look at London, I was watching a discussion, uh, I think two months ago, there, there is a protest. You know, there's been a tendency in London to, 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 to construct high-rising skyscrapers such as the ones you see in Dubai. And the people of London are saying, no, this is wrong. Because when you allow the, 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 the old London houses uh, to be broken down and, and and allow the emergence of those skyscrapers, you are going to make accommodation very expensive in London. And that would chase people away from London. But London must have people living in it. These are the things that the people, you know, these politicians who, who, who sit wherever they sit and pronounce cities should consider. But when the whole thing gets to be captured by the Regime survival curriculum, then it loses meaning. Back to you, uh, Abel. Uh, thank you, Henry. Gerald. You are a student of political science, and I know you should have studied something around decentralization and also the things of urbanization during your time at campus. Uh, we know that the creation of these cities uh, were intended to bring about uh, effective administration and also take the services closer to the people. That was the, the value add. Do you think we have any value add so far? from the, the purposes of creating of this city in terms of service delivery, job creation, are the youth benefiting from some of these things? Uh, thank you so much, Abel, for that very uh, great question. Um, I want to uh, add my voice uh, by saying that in the spirit, of course, of urbanization, creation of districts as 
uh, these Zimbabwean districts as a hub or as a center for development. You know, uh, urbanization, it, it is, um, I looked at it as in support of urbanization policy as a precursor for human and national development. So these cities, we look at them as the, the urban centers where the young people, the, uh, 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 the, 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 these people who are within like this city like Kampala, we see them you know, going back to these very areas where they usually come from to engage in the productive business, in the trade, like uh, particularly the youth. Uh, right now, we have so many youth who are within Kampara. So uh, in the spirit of urbanization and the decongesting, like, uh, you know, one city setting like Kampara, it, it, it is good for development. But um, this newly created district, me, uh, I look at them as they are created, you know, prematurely, because number one, if you can look at uh, the budget framework paper, the 2020-2021, the uh, they did not put them really uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the national resource envelope. So the opera operation, uh, operationalization, uh, I don't know how they planned how these districts, I mean, these newly created cities will run when they did not put them on a, on, on a resource envelope. So in terms of service delivery, of course, the question that you've asked, in the spirit of decentralization, you know, uh, transfer of power uh, from the higher local government or, or from the higher centers to the lower level, you know, it, it was, a, 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 I, I look at it in a, in a good spirit, but some of these very cities, they have... Um, I think Gerald has network issues. Uh, so Henry, uh, I want to get back to you. Eddie, I, I wanted to, to I wanted to, uh, to to come in before Henry comes back. Uh, uh, you know, what we need to understand is that, uh, like I mentioned, cities do not establishment of a city is not a, 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 a an instant process. Establishment of a city is a gradual process. We're not going to 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 light ourselves that we were, we shall see a city grow to the level of Johannesburg or London or Dubai, just like, just like Henry mentioned. It takes time, it takes time to do that. But also there must be a deliberate process, a deliberate intention policy to do that. The logic is in starting. The moment you do not start, then you cannot get to the level where you want. And I want to give you uh, uh, specific examples, for example, in Kampala. When, uh, when uh, Jenny, Jennifer Musisi was in Kampala, she tried to establish a deliberate street lighting uh, project. Uh, and when you move on the streets of Kampala today, it's better than how she came in. Just yesterday I was passing at Kasubi and Kasubi is lit. You can totally see that Kasubi is different from the Kasubi we knew about uh, uh, two or three years ago. When you go to Bukoto, when you go to uh, Fairway, when you go to in the middle of town, you know, if we did not have a deliberate intention to ensure that these facilities are in place, therefore we would not have a deliberate intention of growing them. For me, I, I, I believe in a gradual process where we can have uh, the intention uh, brought forward, but also a plan of developing these cities, cities in the next 10, 20, 40, 50 years. Such as that, but when we wait for, for it to happen in the next 50 years, we shall never get there. Therefore, let us not support, let us not uh, like water down our intentions as a country, but, but try to be deliberate, try to, to support the intention so that we can always grow from one level another level up to your bed. No, thank you. Before we go for a break, I want to bring okay. on Henry. Uh, yes. Ed raises a very interesting point. 
which reminded me of the history we were learning from uh, Oliver to HSC. We, uh, we used to have a very good history teacher at S3. His name is Kiwanu Kakajerero. But one of the things he told us that if, if the colonialists had not come to disrupt the process of development in Africa, by today, Africa would have been as developed as the Singapore of this world. But because someone came, uh, interrupted our development, and then twisted us, our minds, then we stagnated. The point I'm making is cities grow organically. If an urban area has been growing organically, let it grow. But by you coming and pronouncing it a city and then confusing it, then you disrupt the growth. And this is what they have done. Uh, it is, uh, I agree that there must be a, a trajectory, a growth a process, and so, sooner or later they will be, become cities. But they don't become cities, or you don't increase the process of them becoming cities by you making a political pronouncement. It is like a child, th those of us who, who support football, they tell us that if you want to win a league, and you know a league is marathon, you don't uh, say we are winning the league after the first game of the season. You take it one, one game at a time, and then you win the league. So why did they not leave these municipalities to take it one game at a time? Who asked for these? And then they came and deluded everybody. That you see, you are becoming citizens. By the way, for some of us who come from the village, I, I always share with my colleagues that the day they tell you you are going to go to the city, you really don't sleep. And that would be the longest night. Because you can sleep for 30 minutes, you wake up, you think, oh, did they leave me behind? Oh, it is still night. Now, when these fellows were promised that, look, the city is coming to you, they were like, okay, Muhammad refused to go to the, to the mountain. Now the mountain is coming to Muhammad. Okay. So they expected their lives to transform trans just in this time. Mm. Alas, the city came, they pronounced it, the people went to bed, they woke up, they were still the same. Today they are saying, wait a minute, what was given to us here in my only place, they call it the mm -hmm. So I think we agree that there has to be an organic process that should be left on its own to evolve. Because remember, cities also have to do with the mindsets. The person has, the mindset has to transform slowly into the mentality of a city. In other words, if you're going to do what happened here when Idi Amin was in power, he brought the newbies, uh, the people from the newbies to, to, to the city and they occupied the flats. And in the flats, they were rearing goats in the flats. And these goats were clogging the, 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 the toilet system. And before you know, the, the, the whole sewer system had, had blocked. Why? You see, you got the villager, you brought him to the city where the, the village stayed. So, they needed to leave that process to continue. That process did not continue. It was halted. I don't know how we are going to get it back on track. The people's mindsets are different. The people cannot earn. They think you just go to a, a city and, and, and be there. But cities thrive on economic activity. Government has not put in place economic activity. There are no plans. They have not supported local investment. They are talking about foreign investors. The China, they have China is everything. Everywhere you go to China, China, China. Who told you, you city, we are going to grow as a result of China? So I think it's important to go back on the drawing board and rethink how we, we, we evolve our urban centers. But yes, uh, we will urbanize sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going for a brief break, and then we shall return with another edition.